Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. One of the most fascinating aspects of current quantum physics and consciousness is the discussion of holograms and the holographic nature of human consciousness and reality. There are some amazing writers and scientists who have discussed this and presented the idea that perhaps we live in a simulation. The first aspect of this is to understand the holographic nature of reality, understanding what a hologram is and its relationship to consciousness. I wanted to discuss this a little bit further and thought perhaps by gathering some information, we can explore and understand holograms and human consciousness as they relate to the current ongoing reality revolution. And even though this may seem esoteric and scientific in nature, a little bit different than other episodes that we've had, you may find this information very compelling and help you to understand the reality that you're in. We turn, of course, to the most significant new areas of scientific inquiry concerning the nature of the mind. This new area is a confluence of neurophysiology, psychology, states of consciousness, classical Newtonian physics, and contemporary quantum physics. It is essentially holistic research that tests notions of multidimensional models of consciousness. This is the area providing holographic models of consciousness for our consideration. Holograph is derived from two Greek roots, hollow meaning whole, and graph meaning to write. A hologram is an image in which the whole is written into each of the parts just as the genetic information for the entire body is encoded in each cell. This property and others of the hologram represent some of the most potent approaches ever mounted to probe the enigmas of mind-body relationships. Hologram theory was initially developed by the Nobel physicist Dennis Gabor in the late 1940s in an attempt to upgrade the quality of electron microscope photography. The invention of the laser 20 years later made it possible to actually create a hologram which is a three-dimensional image produced by a wavefront reconstruction. To explain the process briefly, coherent light or light of approximately the same frequency is emitted from a laser and strikes a half-silvered mirror. Part of the coherent laser light, a reference beam passes directly through the partially silvered mirror and falls upon the photographic plate. Another part of the laser light is deflected toward a three-dimensional object to be photographed and as a box. After the light is deflected to the box, it is then reflected off the box toward the photographic plate. Light reflected from the box creates an interference pattern with the laser light, which was projected directly through the partially silvered mirror. This resulting interference pattern is recorded on the photographic plate and ends the first stage of creating a hologram of a three-dimensional object. Up to this point, the procedures are a slight variation upon standard photography. However, the real significance of this interference pattern is evident in stages two, when the photographic plate is illuminated with either ordinary or laser light. When light passes through the plate, a wave front is created, and to the observer on the far side of the plate, the resulting image appears to be a full, three-dimensional representation of the original object. As we will see, many aspects of this three-dimensional photography have profound implications for the holographic theory of the interaction between the brain function and consciousness. We in fact may be existing in a holographic reality where light is bouncing off the black hole in the same way. Such a parallel may be found in a model of memory function. Two important properties of the hologram provide evidence for the similarity. If the laser light illuminates only a small portion of the hologram, the observer will still see the complete three-dimensional image, although its details will be less clear. 
If a small section of the photographic plate is cut out and a laser light projected through it, the observer will still see the entire three-dimensional object, although it will be diminished in intensity. Every particle may be holographic in nature, containing the information of the entire universe within it, which can be reflected from that particle. We may apply these holographic properties usefully to instances in which stroke patients report complete but greatly dimmed memories. Furthermore, hologram research lends itself to consideration of such fundamental issues in neurophysiology as the degree to which brain function is isolated in specific anatomical areas and the extent to which all functions are diffused throughout the entire cerebral cortex. People try to say this part of the brain does this, this part of the brain does that. So the brain by its very nature is holographic, meaning that our consciousness may be holographic as well, a sort of reflection. There are long-standing areas of debate regarding whether the functions of the brain are fixed in specific areas or organized more diffusely. A holographic model resolves this dilemma since it accounts for both localized functions as well as the fluidity of that specialized information being stored throughout other areas of the brain. The hologram also serves as a neurophysiological model in which brain function is potentially distributed throughout each cell of the brain, although certain anatomical areas specialize and emphasize certain aspects while other potentials remain dormant in those areas. If this proves to be the case, then it may be possible to devise innovative methods of eliciting this dormant information in patients having suffered traumatic brain damage so that they may regain at least some of their normal functions. Applications of laser theory to brain function may also provide insight into the memory and associative processes. It seems that the brain's ability to associate one bit of information with another finds an analogy in the hologram produced by bouncing laser light off of two different objects. In this procedure, the light reflected from each object becomes the reference wave for the other object. Then if either one of the original objects represented on the photographic plate is re-illuminated with the same laser light at the same angle, the other object will also emerge resulting in two distinct images. This interrelationship of holographic images may provide a useful model for conceptualizing the neuronal associative functions in the brain. Encoding information of the whole in each of its subordinate parts is analogous to the encoding noted earlier where all DNA or RNA genetic information for the entire organism is contained in the nucleus of any single cell of that organism. Clues from the very nucleus of cellular structure can provide insight into such pragmatic clinical problems when intuition accompanies rigorous observation. Formulations of holographic models of the brain may be said to have begun with research of Carl Lashley in the 1920s, which was reported in his monumental work on brain mechanisms and intelligence published in 1929. The initial question addressed by Lashley concerned one of the most fundamental issues of neurophysiology. To what extent are particular psychological or physiological functions localized within specific areas of the brain? Experiments indicate that on a gross level, specific functions do appear to be localized in specific regions. However, other equally valid data indicate that extensive damage to each localized area often does not completely impair the functions associated with them. Focusing on the memory function of the brain, Lashley's experiments demonstrated that large portions of a laboratory rat's cerebral cortex could be exercised, and yet the rat's memory would remain intact albeit dulled proportionally to the amount of tissue removed. From these experiments, Lashley deduced that every memory was stored in every part of the rat cortex, and the intensity of memory depended upon the total number of intact cortical cells. Memory appeared to vary along two parameters, localization and amount of redundancy in the information stored in that location. It may be true that we receive our memory from the universal mind. The brain becomes a localized area where you 
hold the memories for this particular level of consciousness, but it's not in the brain, it's holographically everywhere. Lashley also addressed the question of how the bioelectrical signals of the brain could combine to create stable visual perception. Lashley theorized on the basis of his research that of the innumerable overlapping waves created by the firing of billions of discontinuous neurons, some parts of the wave are canceled out while others are reinforced. So-called interference patterns are generated, stable interference patterns diffused over the entire cerebral cortex, constitute the information of all perceptual patterns and memory. He concluded that visual stability was produced by means of an interference pattern of the waves from the nerve signals and the visual perception functioned in a manner analogous to the photographic plate hologram that Gabor was to describe two decades later. Missing from Lashley's theory was any means for retrieving specific elements from the intricate kaleidoscope of stored information patterns. It was the physicist Gabor who worked out that in order to sort specific bits of information from a hologram, there needs to be a single constant or reference wave form. This waveform must remain constant in both frequency and phase, such that it creates neither interference within itself nor becomes part of the random activity of interference patterns. This requirement kept hologram theory problematical until the invention of the laser beam in the 60s. The invention of lasers provided researchers in physics with a tool for constructing the coherent, stable reference beam that Gabor had in mind, and their advent greatly strengthened the concept that a similar phenomenon would serve an organizing function in holographic theories of neuropsychology. Holographic Models of Memory most recently, the hologram model of brain function is largely the work of Carl H. Prebrum of Stanford University, who began his studies in the early 50s. Prebrum's early research focused on brain function and largely favored use of experimental procedures involving surgery and electrophysiology. In particular, his studies explored the frontal cortex of primates, measured attention by means of eye movements, and determined the effect of food deprivation and pharmacological agents upon motivation. One of Prebrum's major contributions to the development of a hologram theory of brain function was his recognition that holograms can be constructed in infinitesimal layers with each bit of specific information being retrievable. This successive holographic image is superimposed on a single thick photographic plate would have the effect of storing billions of bits of information within a cubic centimeter. Prebrum saw that this may be analogous to the brain's method of storing vast amounts of information within its relatively limited confines. In writing of the hologram theory, Prebrum notes that holography has many fascinating properties among which the facility for distributing and storing large amounts of information is paramount. These properties are just those needed to resolve the paradox posed by the demand for functional liability, the rapidly paced transients in the context of demonstrated anatomical constraints in neural input organizations, Brebrum 1971. Always mindful of the limitations as well as the usefulness of applying analogies to the function of biological brains, Prebrum's research productively explores the areas common to cybernetics, logography, and neurophysiology of brain processes. Proceeding on the basis of a model of the brain as an elaborate and sophisticated computer, Prebrim provides a highly detailed analysis of how information processing occurs in the brain in his book Language of the Brain, Experimental Paradoxes and Principles in Neuropsychology. Now, according to this research, the holograms offering the most potential for understanding brain functions are those which can be expressed in mathematical terms as Fourier transforms. Fourier transforms can best be understood by picturing a continuously oscillating wave. For example, any of the EEG frequencies. Fourier analysis is a means of breaking up such a compound wave into its constituent components 
and conversely a means of generating a compound wave form from its basic components. Such transforms essential in assessing brain activity are an integral aspect of hologram theory. Fourier transforms have a unique attribute since the identical equation convolves and devolves itself and thus any process represented by the spatial Fourier transform can encode and subsequently decode simply by recurring at some second stage. This principle points to the hologram property of storing the whole in each part, each part being capable of generating the whole. It is refreshing to note how similar this concept is to the mystical utterances of William Blake, Neville Goddard's favorite poet, who perceived the universe in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. Properties of space and time are completely elastic in the holographic models of the brain and are strikingly reminiscent of the recorded experiences of individuals undergoing altered states of consciousness. Through the use of Fourier transforms and two concepts borrowed from laser physics, the perplexing problem of long-term memory storage and retrieval becomes resolvable. In Prebrum's theory, memory functions in a two-step process. An individual's short-term memory, which then resonates through the infinite complexity of the brain's stored holograms until an association is triggered in long-term memory. This correspondence between an immediate sensory stimulus and a fragment of stored memory initiates the retrieval of the entire stored memory. Remember, holographic theory states that the whole image is replicated in each of its component parts. There is a total multi-level redundancy, therefore any pattern or pattern set of long-term memory can be elicited selectively from all others with infinite facility. This is why the memory techniques that you read about where people associate one thing to another are so powerful. Just as the memory was encoded within an infinitesimal space by means of a Fourier-like transform, the same memory can be decoded into a certain dimensional wholeness by a precise reversal of the same transform. Through these holographic transformations, a highly complex yet utterly discrete memory can be perceived quite readily from an infinite array of possibilities. It should be pointed out that this, of course, is a highly idealized conceptual model. Variables such as age, sex, stimulus, intensity, circumstances, environment, and more affect the process of memory, recall, and actual experience. The unusual phenomenon of eidetic imagery, commonly known as photographic memory, may also be interpreted in the light of holographic theory. Those who possess the faculty of eidetic imagery have the ability to commit to memory large amounts of visual information in extremely limited brief periods of time. Using an EEG and electrooculograph, or EOG, researchers Daniel Pollan and Michael Trachtenberg treated an individual named Elizabeth, as it happened an art professor at Harvard University, According to these experiments, Elizabeth had normal vision and normal alpha blocking or a shift into fast frequency EEG activity when she was actively attending to the external world during such periods. She claimed to be building up an eidetic image when visually scanning an object or page. However, when involved in calling up the eidetic image with her eyes closed and reproducing that information in a very detailed manner, Elizabeth's alpha rhythm became very prominent, even when she projected an eidetic image of a page from Goth's Faust until a screen six meters away and then read it. Her alpha rhythm was more prominent than when reading an ordinary page of print from the same distance. Although the amplitude of eyes open alpha waves was only a third of her eyes closed alpha waves, the EOG Measurements show that she moved her eyes much less when reading an eidetic page than when reading a real page. Further, when asked to bring an eidetic image as close to her eyes as possible, her eyes turned inward while they were closed, just as if she was actually moving a real picture close to her eyes. Paulin and Trachtenberg suggest a connection between these data and a holographic model of memory that Paulin has put forward. They note that although the entire scene stored in the memory hologram can be remembered from 
just one tiny bit of the hologram, but will be quite dim, just as our usual memory is quite dim. The image will be as vivid as the originally recorded scene if the entire hologram is processed. Perhaps Eidetikers somehow have access to very large regions of memory holograms. Continuing research may give an indication whether or not this is the case. Perhaps these individuals have developed a focused attention, as in meditation, that acts as a form of coherent mental laser that can reconstruct detailed information with great accuracy. As I work with people that learn to visualize and remember, learning this holographic aspect of consciousness can be important. Other evidence that helps to strengthen the position of a holographic model of the brain comes from the work of an Indiana zoologist, Paul Pleisch. Scores of neurophysiological studies of memory have utilized the method of ablating or surgically removing parts of the brain in animal subjects to determine what brain activities are impaired in consequence. I know that sounds terrible, but the evidence of such experiments using laboratory rats has indicated that memory is retained intact if just one small segment of the brain remains intact. While suggestive, these data do not necessarily support a holographic model of brain functioning. They may mean alternately that the storage system of the brain is such that all information, including metaprograms, is recoverable from any specific part of the brain. In contradistinction, the hologram model posits information encoded in a pattern system that is independent of specific brain tissue and or localized functions. If this is the case, then it should be possible to disrupt this tissue completely, but not remove it, and yet not affect normal brain functioning. Pish used and tested this hypothesis in a series of experiments on salamanders. Having an extraordinary capacity for self-regeneration, the salamanders offers researchers a uniquely simple brain-body model to study. If a flesh wound is made and amputation is inflicted upon a leg or tail, the salamander can heal itself or regenerate the severed part completely in a few days. Salamanders also exhibit marked feeding behavior and eat meat almost incessantly, especially to perform worms. Since feeding behavior is believed to be governed by the pre-medular portion of the brain, Pish chose this area for his ablation studies, reasoning that any alterations in brain function would have the readily observable behavioral result of an alteration in the feeding behavior. In his experiments, he excused portions of the salamander's medulla, cut it into small pieces, minced up those pieces, and put this tissue back in the salamander's brain. After a few weeks of recovery, the salamanders were showing their normal feeding behavior. Thus, despite ultra-radical intervention in brain tissues, brain functions remain intact. He asked what other than a hologram model could account for these results. One possibility was that the salamander's feeding behavior was governed from another part of the brain, spinal column, or even from another part of its anatomy. Pish next decided to determine whether the premedular brain did control feeding behavior. If the feeding program is due to a holographic structure in interaction with, but not limited by, brain tissue, and this behavior is unaffected by radical surgical intervention, then it can be altered only by replacing the entire brain with another brain bearing a different feeding program. Additionally, if the feeding behavior program was located elsewhere in the salamander, then the insertion of another brain should have no effect on behavior. Again, the choice of the salamander was judicious since an aspect of its regeneration mechanism is an unusual great capacity for accepting foreign tissue. Pleisch selected the brain of a tadpole for this brain transplant since the tadpole, unlike this worm-eating salamander, is herbivorous. After the brain transplants, the salamanders with tadpole brains are the algae from the surface of a tubiform worm but would not eat the worms, which recall are normally a staple in the salamander diet. Through this series of ingenious experiments, Peach demonstrated that feeding behavior programs did reside within the brain and furthermore that they were encoded in the manner of a hologram. From these experiments, it seems that mental functions are governed by, but not inexorably determined by, brain tissue. Although one cannot extrapolate directly from the salamander to humans when these results 
are considered in the context of the entire body of hologram literature. They seem to demonstrate a marked degree of autonomy between mind and brain. Then we can also talk about slow wave potentials. Carl Prebrim's holographic model of neuropsychology includes a concept of neuronal functioning that differs from the conventional concept of how the nervous system operates. Some three decades ago, Charles Sherrington resolved a pressing issue in neurology research by proposing that nerve cells do not exist in a continuous net of interconnected wiring, but rather are very slightly separated from each other. The point of almost contact he termed the synapse. Electrical charges travel through the neurons on nerve cell up to the point of its termination at the synapse. When a sufficient amount of electrical activity accumulates in graded increments, chemical mediators at the synapse are released into the synaptic cleft. Thus, the electrical impulses of the nervous system are propagated by chemical molecules. When the neuron has discharged, it then turns off and remains in a dormant state until it is fired again. At any single moment, very large numbers of neurons are firing simultaneously, generating a considerable electrical current that can be recorded as an electroencephalogram. This analysis would make it evident why an EEG recorded from the outside or even from the inside of a skull is a grossly average measure of the actual activity of the nervous system. This highly simplistic version of the electrical activity of the nervous system, the EEG records, has remained the dominant model of electrochemical brain function to the present time. Since the late 40s, neurophysiologists have amply documented the existence of the synapse through the use of electron microscopes, an image of electrical discharges jumping the gap between neurons in an all-or-none binary fashion is considered to reflect an incontrovertible fact. However, this concept has been refined by more recent research in physics and neurophysiology, the data of which are incorporated in Prebrim's holography model. Recent experimentation has demonstrated when the single neuron is probed, rhythmic, slow potential energy alternations can be detected within the cell even in the absence of propagated nerve impulses. Slow wave potentials are small short wavelength slow impulses of electrical activity occurring between the synapses. Experimental evidence indicates that the individual neurons do not function in a binary manner, but are rather in a continuous state of activity of varying intensity. Thus, current theory considers two activities of the neuron. One, nerve impulses, unit discharges occurring in a binary on-off fashion on an intracellular basis, and two, graded, slow potential changes that wax and wane continuously at the junction between the neurons. The second attribute of the nervous system contributes to a key concept in the holographic theory. For these continuously undulating slow wave potentials can be influenced by infinitesimal amounts of energy. They thus provide a model by means of which we can conceptualize how the subtle phenomena of consciousness may interact with these comparably subtle physical properties of the brain. Both physicists and neurophysiologists have thought about the details of such a model. For now, it is sufficient to note that the hologram model describes a convergence of the functions of brain and consciousness in mutual interaction. I know a lot of that may have just gone over your head, but I know a lot of you understood that, and it's important to think about consciousness, first of all, from the materialist universe, understanding the neurological and electrochemical processes that are occurring in the brain so that we can understand what's really happening in our consciousness. The evidence for slow wave potentials, for instance, of brain activity provides the neurophysiology of psychological processes with conceptual alternative to the limited confines of the model of relativity gross activity associated with binary conducted nerve impulses. Thus, the new level of subtlety that is observed in the neuron may be an adequate vehicle of the experiential subtleties of consciousness. Another implication of 
Prebrum's model is that these slow wave potentials, being exceedingly minute, are extremely sensitive to the chemical medium that surrounds nerve cells and possibly to other electromagnetic frequencies from the larger environment as well. In other words, hologram theory provides a model for understanding how drugs or spontaneous biochemical imbalances affect behavior by modifying, however slightly, the brain's chemical medium, they alter the ongoing activity of slow potential waves. It also provides raw material for allied theories that would relate environmental influences such as circadian or natural biological rhythms based on the 24-hour day, as well as electrical field activity generated near power stations to changes in the functioning of an individual's nervous system. Furthermore, these slow potential waves may prove to be a link between central nervous system properties and meditation and biofeedback, since both meditation practice and biofeedback training have been associated with sustained slow frequency brainwave activity in ranges comparable to the range of the slow potential wave found at neuronal junctures. Doubtless, the sustained and coherent low-frequency activity of the brain profoundly affects nerve transmission and perhaps these frequencies are intimately involved with the ensuing states of consciousness. All of this must remain highly speculative, but there is considerable research evidence in support of these observations. Essentially, realities are enfolded and unfolded. Hologram theory is significant. For another reason, which ranges just beyond neurology and psychology and studies of behavior per se, it seems that holographic models of the brain are consistent with and supported by the most innovative formulations of contemporary quantum physics. As research neurologists probe the synaptic cleft that have begun to deal with the same orders of magnitude as are addressed in modern physics. For the neurologist, as for the physicist and philosopher, the certainty of objective observation of the physical dimensions of consciousness meet with the limitations expressed in the uncertainty principle. The observed and the observer are no longer separated by space or time. As Carl Prebrum noted, we perceive a physical universe, not much different in basic organization from the brain. For science is of a piece and full understanding cannot be restricted to the developments made possible by the one discipline alone. This is especially true for perception, where perceiver meets the perceived, and the perceived meets perceiver. In effect, the brain and its functions are an integral aspect of the environment that is observed. Nothing can be observed in isolation. One means of talking about the perceived and the perceiver Interaction has been agreed upon by both Prebrum and quantum physicist David Bohm with their use of the terms explicate and implicate. Each theorist notes that scientific analysis explicates extrinsic properties of the physical world. For example, the scientific law of gravity. Juxtaposed to this way of knowing is implicate study, which seeks to understand intrinsic or subjective psychological properties. Each sphere is knowable according to its own rules of observation and the interaction of the two governs the dynamics of an individual's perceptions. In other words, we cannot account for one's constructions of reality until both these ways of knowing are taken into account. Physics has attempted to deal with this realization by accounting not only for experimental observations, but for every aspect of the total field, including the observer. At the most fundamental level of mind and matter, that of synaptic function and quantum charges, the concept of transcendent unitary principle is clearly manifest. And here again, hologram theory provides a way of conceiving how the physical brain may participate in this understanding. Holography requires the existence in the brain of discrete events, such as the nerve impulses, as well as continuous events such as presynaptic, postsynaptic, and dendritic slow potential waves. This is precisely analogous to Neil Bohr's 
complementarity principle, which postulates the existence of discrete events, particle states, and continuous events, wave functions, to account for all the observed phenomena in quantum physics. Most importantly, in both the holographic models of consciousness and the quantum physics model of matter, these two qualities of discreteness and continuity are two special and interdependent cases of a more encompassing whole. Niels Bohr, aware of certain parallels between his formulations of physics and Chinese philosophy, chose the Chinese symbol of the Tai Chi as the center of his coat of arms when he was knighted in 1947. A most graphic representation of this concept is the Chinese Taoist symbol of the yin-yang, a representation of both the discrete and the continuous, which are two complementary descriptions of the same reality, each of them being only part, correct, and having a limited range of application. Each picture is needed to give a full description of the atomic reality, and both are applied within the limitations given by the uncertainty principle. Since individual events at the quantum level are ultimately unobservable and unknowable by direct observation, physics has had to rely increasingly upon statistical and probabilistic constructions of physical reality. According to the, quote, Copenhagen School of Interpretation, the wave equations of Schrodinger and de Broglie are the most adequate descriptions of the average probabilities of chance occurrences of particular singularities or events. Thus, natural science constructs a probabilistic rather than an absolute image of reality. In a parallel manner, the processes of an individual's brain are continuously constructing probabilistic, not absolute, external realities. Reality is a construction created by the interaction of the observer and the observed, and both are discrete aspects of a larger whole. In a more formal sense, reality is dependent upon the probability rather than necessity. This can be illustrated most clearly in the mathematical terms of statistics. Statistics are based upon random distributions governed by overriding mathematical laws of order and form. When particular events are plotted and averaged over time, their occurrences tend to fall in the shape of a normal or bell curve, with the most frequently occurring events represented in the middle and other less frequently occurring events represented in the tails or edges of the bell curve. Mathematically, this configuration is referred to as a Gaussian distribution. An important factor to note is that an average aggregate of random events produces a symmetrical structure. And although little, if anything, can be determined about the individual events, it is possible to determine certain tendencies and overall patterns from the distribution of the individual cases. Quantum physics and virtually all science depends on the concept of certain underlying symmetries that order random events. This concept is fundamental to determining the basic laws governing the properties of matter and is a key concept in considering the properties of human consciousness that order information into an overall image of reality. Virtually all psychology supports the concept of a constructional theory of perception, in which perception is the outcome of an interaction between the physical structure of the brain and a probability distribution of events in the external environment, insofar as structures of perception within the brain are dependent upon the programming and distribution of holograms, then, out of an infinitude of possible perceptions, certain outcomes are pre-selected by the specific holograms of an individual's brain. Perception of events in the tails of the bell curve of probability distribution is not impossible, just unlikely. Our normal mode of functioning is consensual, Thus, individuals tend to perceive only the most frequently occurring set of events, which becomes consistent over time, reinforces itself, and rapidly becomes subjectively and socially institutionalized as the average state of consciousness. However, during an altered state of consciousness, the metaprograms of the individual's holograms are altered, such that the probability of perceiving events in the tails of the curves greatly increases. 
Also, these altered state of consciousness that you have when meditating can do the same thing. It is important to note. There is nothing in natural science or math or probability theory to preclude the concept of altered states of perception. In fact, the evidence seems to dictate the necessity of multiple constructions of reality. The biologist R. Thom has noted the necessity of considering the perception of these improbable events and has developed mathematics specifically for the purpose. In his book, Subil Structurel Amorphage, 1972, he described a type of transiently stable phenomenon emerging from a highly fluctuating field. These he terms catastrophes, no matter how unstable or transient these catastrophes might be, they must be governed by certain mathematical symmetries that are yet to be discovered. These low probability phenomena may provide the means for a fuller understanding of general biological and psychological processes. Research can no longer limit itself to looking at commonly occurring events just because they are the most readily observable ones. Despite the possible difficulties of observing less common occurrences, any comprehensive description of reality requires that they be taken into account. In the material sciences, physicist David Bohm notes that the best opportunities for observing the occurrence of unusual events may be in the interactions among high-frequency, high-energy particles of nuclear reactions or in the proximity of galactic black holes. In science, it is usually the case that for a comprehensive understanding of frequently observed phenomena, one must scrutinize the variations, aberrations, or alterations of these phenomena, just as the data from subquantum levels serve to elucidate the laws of physics. So, too, other properties of altered states of consciousness can serve to amplify and elucidate the entire range of human consciousness. Another observation concerning the uncertainty of particular events within a Gaussian distribution is also important to a science of consciousness. Uncertainty is usually interpreted to mean unpredictability or randomness in a chance with negative connotation. In science, chance or indeterminacy is a nemesis because any purely indeterminate process is ultimately unknowable and cannot be formulated into fixed scientific laws. However, it is also true that the indeterminacy inherent in scientific inquiry has a high positive aspect, for it is uncertainty that provides space for all innovation and creativity. It is from the unexpected, the chance occurrence, or the juxtaposition of unlikely factors that profound insight and discovery arises. In short, chance or unpredictable occurrences in the midst of fixed laws imply the opportunity for innovation and freedom. If the concept of mind is eliminated from science, then uncertainty is understandably negative since it means that man is a passive observer in a universe ultimately beyond his reason. On the other hand, if the universe is a constructed interaction between the observer and the observed, then uncertainty becomes the very factor that allows man to exert his consciousness as an active participant in the universe as a whole. According to Lincoln Barnett, in the universe and Dr. Einstein, nature appears to operate on orderly mathematical principles. Einstein had more poetically observed that God does not play dice with the universe. It appears that probability distribution of events in the physical world interact with the perceptual holographic programs of the observer's brain to produce a construction termed reality. Such a definition of reality requires that all such constructions are tenuous, transient, and illusory to a degree. It is interesting that math should point to an attribute of reality that corresponds to the ephemeral contents of personal consciousness, collectively termed Maya, Sanskrit means illusion, described in most meditation systems, perhaps the ultimate symmetrical functions sought by mathematicians beyond the uncertainty principle are descriptive of such experiences of human consciousness as volition and intention. 
The world's library of mystical literature contains much information relevant to model building in this area. Holographic models of human consciousness require neurophysiologists to take into account events at the same order of magnitude as in addressed in quantum physics. As noted previously, there is nothing inherent in any aspect of the natural science that excludes the consideration of the interface between neurophysiology and the phenomenology of consciousness. Quite the opposite, it seems increasingly necessary to theorize the presence of such non-physical entities in the most advanced area of science. That includes math and physics and neurology. These researchers who have attempted to penetrate the ultimate mystery of mind in interaction with matter have focused upon quantum events occurring in and among the neurons of the brain. Early in the development of quantum mechanical theory, it was recognized that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle had a direct bearing on the philosophical problem of free will. Niels Bohr suggested that certain key points in the regulatory mechanisms of the brain might be so sensitive and delicately balanced they should properly be regarded as quantum mechanical in nature and could be considered to be the physical mechanisms by which an individual exerts will or volition. Another physicist, Sir Arthur Eddington, examined the possibility that the mind controlled the brain within the limits allowed by the Heisenberg principle. Although he eventually discarded the idea since he considered the range of influence to be too small to affect the physical brain. Speculating in the context of neurological knowledge of the mid-30s, Eddington addressed his thinking to an object as large as the neuron or the nerve cell. Nerve cells are tree-like in appearance, with one branch of the cell body usually longer than the others. This is the axon, which carries electrical current from the cell body to its terminal point or end foot that is in close proximity to other cells. If the adjacent cell is another neuron, then the zone of interaction is a synapse, the space between the two neurons being the synaptic cleft. Quite importantly, the synaptic cleft is on the order of 200 to 300 angstroms, which is a magnitude in the range considered by quantum physicists. In the current understanding, the transmission of nerve impulses across this cleft is initiated by a nerve impulse arriving at the end foot and causing the release of packets of chemical neurotransmitters, which are infinitesimally smaller than 200 angstroms from the synaptic vesicles or sacs, which are part of the presynaptic terminal. Actually, the precise process is still not understood for the delicately poised, highly volatile synaptic activity is only now beginning to be studied in terms of quantum physics. Graded, slow potential changes wax and wane continuously at the junction between the neurons. These potentials can be influenced by infinitesimal amounts of energy on the order of quantum events. Interestingly, in the earliest exploration of the cortex by electron microscopy, researchers expected to find something unique about synaptic organization in areas concerning higher functions. It was assumed that those cells would bear some property that would not be found. For one example, in cells of the spinal column, however, in recent years they have concluded that the basic nature of the synapse is constant throughout the nervous system. In fact, all synapses are alike in their essential features and in their mode of chemical transmission. These appear to be no essential differences between the parts of the nervous system that, like the spinal column, are associated with autonomic activity and those that, like the cortex, are associated with mentation, imagery, and other such higher order phenomena of consciousness. Commenting on the convergence between the quantum physics and innovations in neurophysiological measurement that neurologist John C. Eccles has pointed out that the synaptic vehicle embedded in the prosynaptic terminal 
is an approximate spherical structure of 400 angstroms in diameter and that Eddington thought that the uncertainty principle was applicable to an object of this size. Having calculated the uncertainty of the position of such an object to be about 50 angstroms in one millisecond, this value is extremely significant because 50 angstroms might be the order of magnitude in which consciousness might operate in interaction with the neurophysiological mechanisms of the brain within the limits allowed by uncertainty. According to Eccles, it is therefore possible that the permitted range of behavior of a synaptic vesicle may be adequate to allow for the effective operation of the postulated mind influences on the active cerebral cortex. Neurophysiologists and physicists are now familiar with many of the details of all cell life. Many consider synaptic vesicles, slow wave potentials, and Fourier transforms to be the key principles by which mind is operational. Experimental research by Eccles and other neurologists has yielded data permitting great refinement of the concept of ephemeral mind acting upon static matter. Theirs is a model of ineffably subtle interactions among infinitesimally small energy fields occurring in quantum space. Advanced thinking about brain function no longer employs those metaphors that we hear often, the hardware metaphors of the brain, as a machine or even a sophisticated computer. Rather, the brain is thought to function by virtue of a spatio-temporal field of influence. Eccles noted, these spatio-temporal fields of influence are exerted by the mind on the brain in willed action. If one uses the expressive terminology of Ryle, the ghost operates a machine, not of ropes and pulleys, valves and pipes, but of microscopic spatio-temporal patterns of activity in the neuronal net woven by the synaptic connections of 10,000 million neurons, and even then only by operating on neurons that are momentarily poised close to a threshold level of excitability. It could appear that it is the sort of a machine a ghost could operate, if by ghost we mean in the first place an agent whose action has escaped detection even by the most delicate physical instruments. A ghost that has escaped and might elude detection by physical instrumentation within the limits of the uncertainty principle would certainly be a cause of, for despair if inquiry into the nature of consciousness were to be limited to physical observation of events in the brain. Fortunately, the mind is able to reflect upon itself and thus to transcend this limit and provide another approach through systematic study of phenomenology of consciousness. A case in point is the theory of quantum physicist Evan Harris Walker at the NASA Electronics Research Center in Cambridge. Writing in Mathematical Biosciences, Walker purports to demonstrate the mathematics by which quantum events in the brain operate in the synaptic cleft and give rise to conscious perception. His basic thesis is that it is possible for neurophysiological and consciousness states to interact within the limits of certain basic mathematical constraints. For example, with reference to the precise mechanism of neurotransmitters, Walker cites a phenomenon in physics whereby an electron can tunnel through a barrier which, as is found in the presynaptic membrane of the synaptic cleft, and initiate a large flow of electrons once the delicate electrical potential has been altered. According to Walker, in fact, under the conditions existing at the synaptic cleft in which electric impulses apparently propagate to within a mere 200 angstroms, it would be surprising if quantum mechanical tunneling did not occur. Furthermore, Walker postulates that these short-range tunneling processes act in accord with long-range tunneling that propagates over distances in the brain as great as several centimeters. He derives equations for different speeds of data processing for three states of consciousness, a rate for subconscious activity, an average data processing rate for the active brain, and a decision rate during which he postulates that attention sorts among alternatives and exercises choice. Walker's theory is expressed in complex mathematical formulations, not readily translatable into verbal metaphors. The version presented here can hardly do it justice. His major conclusion, however, 
can be stated succinctly. One, consciousness is both real and non-physical. And two, consciousness is coupled to the physical brain by means of quantum mechanical wave functions. And three, the brain is a logical instrument that employs a certain physical process for some of its data management, a process that can be properly described only by quantum physics. And most importantly, four, events in the brain are governed by a higher order, what is termed as hidden variable in physics, and these hidden variables are synonymous with consciousness. Clearly, it is not possible to evaluate Walker's theory at the present time. Notwithstanding, it is a remarkably inclusive attempt to apply the principles of math and quantum physics to the phenomena of consciousness. Walker's work stands as one of the first comprehensive attempts to define that process hypothesized by Sir John Eccles, through which will modifies the spatio-temporal activity of the neuronal network by exerting spatio-temporal fields of influence that become effective through this unique detector function of the active cerebral cortex. Eccles went on to equate the act of will with some unknown agency acting in concert with neurological activity of the brain. As he wrote in Neurophysiological Basis of Mind, it is a psychological fact that we have the ability to control or modify our actions by the exercise of will. And in practical life, all sane men assume they have this ability. By stimulation of the motor cortex of the exposed brain of patients undergoing a brain operation, it is possible to evoke complex motor acts in a conscious human subject. The subject reports that the experience is quite different from that occurring when he willed a movement. There was the experience of having willed an action which was missing in the other. The basic issue raised by such observation concerns volition. What is the nature and mode of operation of the act of will? For the first time, it is possible for science to address such issues objectively through formal systematic constructs of holographic and quantum models of the brain. We may ask, for example, is it possible that Imagery is the phenomenological aspect of spatio-temporal fields or of long-range quantum mechanical tunneling. Modern physics has rendered a model of the brain as a highly sensitive, poised system wherein the discharge of any one neuron contributes directly and indirectly to the excitation or inhibition of millions of other neurons within the very brief time of 20 microseconds. The quantum view of the brain function permits one to imagine how unobservable psychological factors could have profound effects therein. When the body and mind were looked upon as a solid versus ethereal interaction seemed likely, that a subtle image could bear influence on a gross physical organ was an absurdity. However, as modern biophysics demonstrates that the body is a volatile, fluctuating electromagnetic field. Indeed, an infinitely interlocked series of fields within fields. A model of mind-body interactions emerges where the subtle properties of consciousness can be shown to have profound effects upon physical processes. These observations are of great importance in considerations of states of psychosomatic disorder and states of health, as well as being a fundamental aspect of a science of consciousness. Holographic models have given new impetus to considerations of the psychological concepts of imaging and imagery, including the internal imagery so characteristic of altered states. Prebrim observed recent behavioral research has put a foundation under imaging and neurological research as well as insights derived from the information processing sciences have helped make understandable the machinery which gives rise to this elusive ghost-making process. Any model of perceptual processes must thus take into account both the importance of imaging, a process that contributes a portion of man's subjective experience, and the fact that there are influences on behavior of which we are not aware. Through images and sensations and feelings or emotions, an individual manifests his basic orientation toward himself, others, and the world as a whole. We will see how it is possible that individual's intention and sensitivity to his own internal images and sensations, 
is psychosomatic self-awareness is of vital importance in determining his state of health or illness. We have seen that processes at the quantum level are unobservable, but seem to be organized in a matter analogous to an organization of mind. Support for the study of the non-physical properties of mind comes from modern physics, the most advanced science of our era, and yet, ironically, the approach is shunned by most contemporary psychology as unscientific. Physics never hesitates to postulate an unobservable existence if that seems to be the only way to interpret the facts. Such unobservable existences abound in quantum physics, for example, electromagnetism, gravity, photons, virtual particles, and many others. Therefore, it would seem reasonable to expect that constructs such as mind, attention, awareness, and Volition will serve equally well in the case of the interaction of brain and consciousness, i.e. their use will impart considerable explanatory power to theoretical problem-solving in future eras. Niels Bohr considered his principle of complementarity to be a general philosophical principle that might be applicable to the relationship between mind and matter, although he did not systematically work out this position. Sir Arthur Eddington's early insight that matter in liaison with mind would create a situation of matter which would be in direct contrast to the random behavior of matter postulated in physics. It is still viable. Wilder Penfield's observation that consciousness and the physical brain are discrete but interactions seem increasingly probable. This position, which has achieved a degree of acceptance in neurophysiology, has been succinctly stated a comparison of the specific micro-neural situations in which consciousness does and does not arise suggests that the brain functions not as a generator of consciousness, but rather as a two-way transmitter and detector. Although its activity is apparently a necessary condition, it cannot be a sufficient condition of conscious experience. This statement echoes Aristotle's idea that the mind is attached to the body thereby hints at the enormous philosophical implications of contemporary research in approaching this enigmatic area of psychosomatic interaction. It is necessary to adhere to the observable empirical data of neurophysiology and also to acknowledge its limitations in addressing the phenomenology of consciousness. Too often, the concept of consciousness has been relegated to a passive connotation of that which is experienced or to a minimally active role of sorting impinging stimuli. Now it has become necessary to postulate consciousness as an active organizing principle that coordinates the divergent functions of the physical brain in a focused and purposive manner and operates at the quantum level where mind and matter are in inextricable interaction. According to molecular biologist Gunther Stent, and limits to the scientific understanding of man, it is becoming incumbent upon researchers to approach the concept of a unitive principle of the self. To this end, the phenomenology of mind noted in meditative traditions is highly instructive. We will see that these data are necessary complements to the otherwise obscure observations of the electrical activity of the brain. All individuals have a sense of unity principle of being and everyone formulates his personal philosophy and way of life on the basis of that perception. What a magnificent event it is to discover that both science and deeply personal knowledge can share common ground. I know that many of you stopped the podcast earlier and many of you maybe phased out a little bit when you're Reporting scientific information, oftentimes the language and the wording and descriptions um, can derail you a little bit. To summarize, ultimately, these researchers have shown that the way the brain works, that you cannot identify a particular part of the brain that does a specific function. You can to some extent, but when that portion of the brain is removed, it still functions like that. Now, if you look at space and look at the interaction of the stars, many of you have seen the very common image that it is like a brain. And all of space is working like this large field. And 
even though it seems like we're light years apart, that's the synaptic cleft that we're talking about. So if it is possible that every single item is a part of the whole, then we start to understand how the simulation comes together and how what we're experiencing essentially is a holographic mirror of an internal process that is separate. The ghost they're talking about is you, this part of you that creates and guides your consciousness and your will. But the science is very clear and looking at both physics and neurophysiology, we can see that there is a mind-body interaction that can easily be demonstrated and we can have a better understanding of the holographic nature of our body, which affects our consciousness on many different levels. I know a lot of this may not have made sense, but it does establish the fact that this holographic model, both of consciousness, the brain, and all of reality, is still relevant and important in understanding consciousness. So I know some of you may be interested in this discussion of it. I'd love to get more information. If you have any recommendations of books or material that can guide us through this, please put it in the comments. I'd love to get your comments. And I won't do this very often, but every once in a while, I want to kind of go on another bent so that we can create some scientific validity for the reality revolution that we're going through now. And it is a revolution. That's the important thing. We're going through a revolution in consciousness. This revolution is a way of understanding the connection between the brain and the world. That our mind and our consciousness affects the matter around us. That we are intricately involved in it. And the law of one is saying that. All is one. Not just all people, but all things. Everything is all one. All the part of one big hologram. And our realization of that will give us power and understanding over our consciousness. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.